Well, welcome to another edition of Now You Know. I'm Chris Perkins, and we're back with a very familiar guest. And I guess I call him old friends at this mm -hmm. point because we've had him on several times over the years, and actually last fall. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, reintroducing David Richards, who is director of the Margaret Chase Smith Library. And uh, David, we're sitting in the, I call it sunroom, but. Yeah, or atrium is yeah, another atrium term we use. Chase, what was part of her house. Yeah. And it's absolutely beautiful and it's absolutely warm <laughs> on a May day that we're lucky if it's 50 degrees outside. And I was telling our producer, John, uh, before we went on the air, that I said there's a reason that I wait a while before I plant my peas mm -hmm. in the spring. And today is another example of Maine's fickle May weather. Yes, I heard the frost warnings on yeah, the news last night. freeze warnings yeah. tonight. So um, I'm glad I'm waiting a couple of days. Very good. Smart so, man. Yep. Yeah. So anyways, uh, we did a show last fall. We got into the history of the Margaret J. Smith Center and did a tour around mm -hmm. the center and so forth. And we're not going to do that today because we kind of covered that ground last time. But this time, um, we're going to talk about really all the events that are going on at the Margaret Chase Smith Center this year. Um, you know, it's 2023, and now it's been three years since the start of COVID. And, and once that happened, everything went remote. A lot of the yeah. events got shut down, and, and you guys... Uh, were quiet for a little while on events, but it looks like in 2023 you're going to more than make up. We're back with a bang. Period. You're back <laughs> with a bang, and there's so many things going on that I had to be provided <laughs> with a cheat sheet today because I'm usually trying to do things from memory um, that uh, my memory sometimes fails mm -hmm. me, but I remember most of it. So, but today I got my cheat sheet, and that helps. Mm -hmm. And David, if you want, we can go right down the cheat sheet. You sure. Kind of tell me some of these are past events, yeah. but a good percentage of them are future events. Mm -hmm. And the the thing on the top of the list here is Transformations Book Discussion Series, and all of those have happened. Uh, and wait a minute, yeah, May yes. 16th, yes, one, the last one just happened. We just concluded last night that book discussion series. We always try to organize them around a theme, and uh, Transformations was the theme for this winter, Yeah. and uh, concluded with a book called uh, Flight by Sherman Alexi last night. And now we'll be moving on to a new series beginning in June, and the theme there will be Skowhegan's Bicentennial. Yes, I see that. So we have four books that we will do as part of the Bicentennial. We'll start off with a talk by Amy Calder about the book that she's recently written, a collection of some of the stories that have appeared in the Morning Sentinel in her, I think, over 30 years of being a reporter and columnist. And she's perfect for the Skowhegan Bicentennial because Amy is... A local, local girl. Yeah. Uh, she grew up in Skowhegan and mm -hmm. has been with the Morning Sentinel for, well, over 30 years. Over yeah. 30 years. And, and she wrote an email me today to say that she was going to share a letter that Margaret Chase Smith had written about her and she was going to share some Margaret stories as well. Oh, so, that would be yeah. So that's, a, that's an actual live event. Live oh, event, June gonna, 20th. She's yep. going to talk. 6.30 p.m. And she's going to sign books. Signs, yep. And that sounds pretty interesting. So on June 20th, so what did you say, 6.30 p.m., come yes. to the library mm -hmm. and listen to Amy talk. And Tell stories about the local area. And, and Margaret Chase Smith. And Margaret Chase Smith. So that should, that should be Fine. Yeah. And you've got some other ones, and these are just pure book readings this, this time, right? Yeah, I mean, book discussions. And yeah. uh, you have a group that comes in and they read the books and yeah. they discuss the books. And, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, so this is actually the, the next two books coming up in July and August, are, and actually the one in September as well. It's a series we did a couple of years ago, but because it was Skowhegan's Bicentennial, Main Street Skowhegan has been trying to organize a lot of activities around the Bicentennial. Yeah. And so they asked for a reading list. You can go on to the Main Street Skowhegan uh, website and you can find a list of books that are related to the local, the history of the local area. Okay. And then we took some of those and turned them into a, a book discussion 
series. Yeah. Okay, yeah. well that makes sense. And, and got, we do it, um, coming out of COVID, we actually do it hybrid now. So some people come to the library, but some people are also doing it via Zoom. We have people in um, Brooklyn, New York, Washington, D.C., in oh. Juneau, Alaska. We had someone from um, New York, upstate New York and someone from South Carolina. So that's sort of the, the beauty of what's come out of COVID is these new technologies that sort of extend our, our reach. I was, that's pretty interesting because yeah. I was in the book club. I probably yes. get back in the book club, but yeah. I was in the book club for a little while and it was just back, this is probably at least five or six years ago, and it was just a just a local group meeting and the round mm -hmm. the table and discussing the book. So this is really a, a national event now. Well, all of these people have some connection to either the local area or to the library. It's just a matter of they've moved away, but they okay. still want to be part of the group. So we now can offer them the opportunity to do it through Zoom. Well, I think, you know, and this is certainly an example of that. You're going to, now that people are coming back, with live meetings, um, still not all of them can be right where you are. Mm -hmm. So the Zoom allows you to do all this hybrid stuff now, yeah. Yeah. which is kind of nice. Yeah, and sometimes uh, we've had the case where a speaker was not able to come to Skowhegan, but we could use Zoom and have that speaker be available to our audience. Absolutely, so. absolutely. You've got some other books here on, in July, July 18th, Polly's Secret, A Story of the Canabac. That's actually a story um, written by a local person, and the setting is the old Lock Tavern. I'm sure you remember the Lock Tavern um, at the corner of, um, it's across the street from the Southside Tavern. It was, it, was, oh, it, yes, it burned yes. down several years ago. Yes, yes, okay. Yeah. It's Got been it. beautified now, and you know, the, the, <laughs> running the traffic through it now at the, the light, um, but it was a, a very historic old building that had been a tavern. That's right. That's okay. So you got that. Uh, the Golden Boys and their new electric cell. So that is by a man named Levi Parker Wyman, who again was from the local area. In the early 20th century, he wrote books for boys. So there's a whole series of these Golden Boys books. And the reason we picked this one is that it's set at Lake West and runs it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I, I just looked at the titles and I, for a couple of them, I said, does that have anything to do with Skowhegan? They definitely do. Yeah, it definitely does. Yeah. Okay. They're both set in Skowhegan. Yeah. Okay. And there's actually, what you'll see are links on there. So these are books that are available to anyone because they're freely available online. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then finally you have a pretty well-known book, yeah. Arundel by Kenneth Roberts. Right. Now, Which I think came out in the 1930s. Uh, he was a very... Um, well-regarded main author, wrote historical fiction, and this is an account of the Benedict Arnold expedition up the Kennebec, into Quebec, to attack Quebec City during the Hence American... the Skowhegan connection the, there. Yes, that's they the all Skowhegan, have Skowhegan connection. connection. Yes, yep. And in, in conjunction with that uh, book discussion, um, afterwards, after we do the book discussion, we're going to have a humane professor come and give a talk, his doctoral dissertation was on the Arnold Expedition. And both Dan Soucy, the UMaine professor, and Kenneth Roberts, the way they were both able to do their works is very extensive journals were kept by the soldiers okay. on the expedition. Okay. So that's why so much is known about the expedition. And what Dan was interested in was that as these soldiers went up the Kennebec and the Chaudière to Quebec, how were they regarding the environment, the landscape around them? So that was really his focus. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Now that's coming up on September 26th, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. Arnold Expedition. So that's interesting. And you've got uh, Earl Shuttleworth, whose yes. name is familiar to me. And it's going to be talking about Skowhegan architecture mm -hmm. on um, July 25th. Mm -hmm. Our Earl is the Maine State Historian. He yep. was the head of the Maine Historic Preservation Commission for about 40 years. Yep. And he actually just last night received what's called the History Maker Award from the Maine Historical Society. So he's like the expert on Maine history, in particular the architectural history yep. of the state of Maine. And he's spoken here before at the library. Um, and again, this is part of the bicentennial celebration that 
Main Street Skag and, and some of the other people part of the committee overseeing the bicentennial thought we really need to have someone come and talk about the architecture of Skowhegan. And Earl has a very strong connection to Skowhegan. He went to Colby mm -hmm. and his parents used to, in the summertime, go up to Lake West Sunset. Okay. So he has very vivid memories of his teen and college years coming through Skowhegan oh, and spending summer times up on Lake West Sunset. Oh, okay, Runset. so he's got a definite yes, connection. Yes, he definitely has an affinity for Scout. So all these people have some connection. Yeah, together, which is, yes. Which is kind of nice. Yeah. And, and speaking of the bicentennial, it, 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 um, and maybe it's because of COVID or whatever, it's coming kind of quietly mm -hmm. this year. I really, personally, I haven't heard a lot about it mm -hmm. until fairly recently. Do you know, is this going to be, you guys are part of a much bigger... Yeah celebration that's going on? Do you know anything about that? So I think the official anniversary date, I believe, was sometime in February. Okay. That's when Skowhegan officially, officially was brought into existence. And they did do something at the town office, uh, but Main Street thought, well, that's February, and we still got 10 more months to go. Let's do some more stuff. Uh, so they brought together a group of people, uh, probably in March, and we start sitting down thinking of other things that could be done. So I think some other organizations like Scouting History House, they're going to be planning some events. Um, th these are the events that we came up with. Um, we were very specifically asked to uh, put together the reading list, which again, you can find online if you go to the Main Street Scouting website, and, and then also to have a lecture series. And so you can see how we sprinkled in some speakers. Uh, we already had the book discussion series planned. We didn't have one specifically on the bicentennial, so we added that one. We might have taken a break during the summer, but we decided that would be the time we would fit in hmm. book discussions about Skowhegan. Yeah. yeah, yep. And you've got, now, now something you just had here and uh, was, uh, you had Carol Ware. We did. Talk about, and certainly a Skowhegan person, mm -hmm. and talk about his book on the wrong side of the river stories from a main guy yeah. and carol and his wife lila are very fascinating people yeah. who um have uh done guiding mm -hmm. throughout the country and throughout the world yeah. i think taking yes. people on trips so i can only imagine and i should have been there but <laughs> only imagine that was a very fascinating time so the connection there is that we had an exhibit that was on loan from the Rangeley Lakes Historical Society. And the exhibit was about President Eisenhower coming to Maine in 1955. Right. The primary reason that he came was to go fishing up at the Rangeley Lakes. Yeah. So that's what their exhibit was about. Okay. And the uh, star piece of that exhibit was President Eisenhower was a painter. Yeah. And he painted a portrait of his guide, Don Cameron. I read so that. that yeah. So that was the centerpiece of the display that we had, which we just recently had to return. And until I read that, and, so, and you mentioned it, I didn't, I didn't realize Eisenhower was a painter. Yeah. You can actually Google Dwight Eisenhower paintings, and some other ones will come up as well. That's interesting. Yeah. And when he came here, I... Did he ever go to the Skowhegan State Fair? He did. At the fairground, yes. right? Yes. So going to Rangeley, he stopped in Skowhegan. I think it's, he, they came to Bangor. They drove through Pittsfield. They came to Skowhegan. They did the motorcade. They went up to the fairgrounds, and he gave a speech. And then the senator had arranged for the president, his aides, and the press corps to have a steak and lobster dinner out on the back lawn, which was catered by Tykes. Oh, yes, uh, Jean's Restaurant. Uh, right, yes, Jean's, yes. Now, now we're going back a ways. Yes, yeah. yeah. Well, 1955. <laughs> <laughs> well, 1955 happened to be the year I was born. Okay. And so, and I think my parents went to see Eisenhower speak at the fairgrounds. Mm -hmm. And I, so I was, I was born a couple months later. Okay. And I said, I was there. I just had ah, struck there with you. you. <laughs> That's a great line. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so they put on a steak and lobster dinner for the president and his entourage out on the back lawn. The other thing that she did is that she knew he liked to play golf. Yes. So she uh, made a little mini pitch and putt golf course for him. We still have the flags for the golf course that she made. Oh, yeah. interesting, yeah. interesting. That, that was tough. So and the tie-in was because of this exhibit and the theme, that's why we had Carol, a main guard, come he, and speak. 
Oh yes, yeah. okay, that yeah. makes that makes sense. But but also he had just come out with this new book as well. Right, right, yes, yes. Yeah. It's sort of the so, double tie-in. Yeah, yeah, good tie-in, yeah. and he uh, and which is a collection of stories he's accumulated over the years as he's guided, and he's got some great stories to tell. Yeah, but it's really a team. It's it's. Carol and Lila. Lila. Lila sometimes has to prod him to tell stories, <laughs> and then she sometimes has to reel him in when he's thinking it when going, he gets into great detail. When he gets going too long. So yeah. they're a great team together. Absolutely. And then the other thing that we did in conjunction with that exhibit is because Eisenhower had done painting, we did a paint night, and we had Gretchen Washburn come. Okay, I saw that too. And yeah. so that was tied in with that. That was tied in, yeah. So the scene that they did was. Uh, sort of a, a scene of a canoe on a lake. Okay. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. I knew she did paintings. And stuff yeah, like she, she, has, she goes around and does these different paint nights. Yeah. Oh, it, was, uh, it was very sex, sex, successful. I think we had about 13 people. Good. Yeah. Now, um, you've got some other things coming up, and, and uh, coming up in really just about a week. From yes, when next we're week. recording next this Thursday. Show. Next Thursday, well, May May twenty yeah. fifth, and this will be on the air before then. John assures me, right, John? <laughs> okay, uh, that uh, you're going to have a main town meeting first time in three years. Well, the first time first. fully in fully. person. Yes, in person. So um, you know, COVID hit in March of twenty twenty. We already had the twenty twenty main town meeting planned yeah. for May. But of course, we couldn't bring everyone together. So uh, we had three speakers lined up. So what we did is we just did three Zoom presentations. Oh, okay, okay. And then the next year, knowing that COVID existed, we just completely organized it as a Zoom presentation. Okay. And then last year, what we tried to do is the hybrid format. So inviting some people to come here and some people to watch online. And what we found is if you give people that option, most people are going to take the convenient option. So we yeah. didn't have many people come here. Yeah. So this year we decided, nope, it's just going to be in person to try to get people back to the library. Well, I don't know about you, but I, I mean, I've done more than my fair share of hybrid meetings in mm -hmm. recent years. And I mean, it, it's a great way, particularly for people that are long distance and can't get there yeah. uh, to go to a meeting. But you still don't, have the level of interaction I think yep. you'd have if people were right there. Yeah. So last night, two people who have been doing the book group via Zoom decided to come in person. Yeah. And they said it, it's a completely different experience. If you're home, it's almost like you're listening to a lecture. Yeah. Um, but they said you feel that it's more social when you're actually in the room with the bulk of the people who are having the conversation. And you can see everybody you can see their reactions you yeah. can kind of play off the yeah it's much way. easier to pick up on the body language exactly. i mean i find that as the facilitator it's hard to know when the people on the screen want to chime in you sort of pick up a vibe in the room when exactly. someone wants to say something exactly it's hard to pick up on those cues when they're just on a screen and there's like four six eight of them on a screen there's only so much you can be well, paying attention well thank to. god for zoom because it kept us going yeah. and kept some level of social interaction while mm -hmm. all this COVID was going on, but it still doesn't replace yeah. being there on the scene. Yeah, it's going to be one of the tools in the kit, and there'll be some times when we'll just co go completely Zoom, there's some times when we'll still try to do the hybrid, but there's other times, no, we want this to be an on-site live event. And that's what the main town meeting is going to be. It's next uh, Thursday, May 25th. Mm -hmm. from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. and mm -hmm. it's catered by the Heritage House as an extra enticement. Yes, I often think that the main attraction may be the Heritage House meal. <laughs> <laughs> well, <it's laughs> whatever it takes to get people here. It's a good attraction, yeah. but you have um, uh, Professor James Melcher, who is a political science professor at the University of Maine at Farmington. John's chiming in on this because he probably remembers him. Uh, and uh, Dimitri, uh, Dean Dimitri Bam, University of Maine Law School, mm -hmm. and they're going to be here speaking on that. And the, and the subject is the directions and decisions of the Supreme Court. Court, mm -hmm. and God knows that's been controversial lately. This yeah, they've court. had some so controversial is... cases. I mean, they've had a case that upturned, overturned precedent, the Roe versus Wade 
decision was overturned, and that's very rare for the court to do that. One of yeah. the things that courts are based on is the idea of precedent, that they try to maintain the decisions that they've had in the past. So this is a case where they've made a 180 degree turn. So that will be one of the cases that's considered. Uh, Professor Melcher has been doing these talks for quite some time. Uh, there is a mandate from Congress that any educational institution that gets federal money is supposed to celebrate Constitution Day, which is in, I think, mid-September. It's when the Constitution became ratified. Right, yeah. So what Humane Farmington has done over the years is have Professor Melcher give uh, uh, an, a summary of decisions from the previous Supreme Court term. The term usually begins about September, so he's looking at the cases that were decided the year before. And Professor Melcher is a very dynamic, colorful speaker. So he takes these very dry cases and he very much brings them alive. Well, he's got some color in these cases anyway. He does, so yes. He's got some meat to them. He's got some meat to them. But he's very good at being able to distill these very complicated cases down to about 10 minutes. Yeah. So the lay person can understand what the issues are. Yeah, and that well, I guess the Roe versus Wade thing is definitely by far the most controversial thing mm -hmm. they've done. But he'll be talking about other. Well, the other this well. was uh, a, a, you know the Roe versus Wade, and that's not the name. That's the case that's getting overturned. The, the case that actually came before the court has a different name to right, it. Right, right. That affected obviously the whole country, but there was one that very particularly. Uh, came out of Maine, and that was the case of whether state funds can be used for students who want to go to religious, religious schools. Yes, yes. And right. so the ruling was if they have a menu of choices, and the choice is uh, a public school or a private school or a religious school, the state can't say just because it's a religious school, yeah. they can't have that choice. Um, so uh, that is a case that rose up out of Maine, yeah. and that'll be one of the ones that he considers. Well, it's going to be interesting in the future years because it looks like it's going to be conservative court for a while. Mm -hmm. So It's about, generally speaking, it's six to three conservative to liberal right now. There are, depending on what the issue is, there's a couple of justices who are sort of in the middle. John Roberts. Yeah, maybe. he tries to sort of be in the middle, but even at that, that would be five to four. Um, so, yeah. Um, no, it'll be, well, I guess we won't get into the, the controversy. Of this well, the second here, speaker, uh, Dean Dimitri Bam um, from the, uh, the Maine School of Law, um, he's going to be more addressing those issues. So what is the direction of the court? And talk about some of the different judicial philosophies that are coming to bear on these cases. Yeah. Should be fascinating. So that's going to be, that discussion's for really about for three hours, and then you, or close yeah, to Yeah, nine it. to noon, roughly an hour and a half for each speaker with their, pre, you know, 45 minutes for a presentation, then some time for questions. Um, and then at noon time, that'll be followed by the meal from Heritage House. And it's going to be roughly 50, 50, 55 people there. Yeah, we tried to limit it to 50, of course. We have to be like the airlines. We have to overbook a little bit. There's, there's <laughs> yeah. always some no-shows. Uh, so I think we're right around 60. Uh, the big decision at the end, I think we're about 45 people. And then uh, the AP U.S. history teacher at Skyline High School, Heather Ross, contacted us and said she'd really like to bring her class over. Uh, and I couldn't say no, no. to a group of uh, high school students because, I mean, they, as the saying goes, they are our future. So, oh, you know, absolutely. We, we wanna... and, and I think Margaret J. Smith would be. Oh, definitely, yes. She, I mean, that's why she set up this facility the way she did to have the museum and library right here at her house because she wanted to be the one telling her story to school groups. Well, speaking of children, I mean, you started the, the children's tours coming back in the library. Matter of fact, the the uh, taping of this program, we usually tape in the morning, but there was a group of children going through the library. Yeah, we had morning. four groups last week, and we have two groups this week. Uh, Clinton Elementary School was here this morning, and tomorrow we have the Cascade Brook School from Farmington. So it's been a very busy spring of field trips. Once again, coming out of COVID, we can do yep. this stuff. Yep. So they started to come back last spring, uh, but even at that, it was still a lot of them, um, we had to wear masks, some of them had to wear masks, and so there was sort of still that barrier. But this is the first 
spring where no restrictions. So what happens on a, on a children's tour of the library? What, what, do, you, what uh, do you do or what do you present? We have them come in and we show them a video that's about 20 minutes long that gives them the overview of Margaret's life. Uh, and then we divide them up into four groups, and one group will start out in the museum, one group will start in the house, one group will start in the research room, and one group will do an activity. And we just rotate them through those four stations. Mm. And then they have, uh, we bring them back together and let them ask any questions that they have. Mm. And then they have lunch, and then they're on their way. So they're usually here between two and three hours. So do the schools contact you folks about doing this, they're just aware that, that... Yeah, we have a lot of uh, groups that just every springtime we know they're going to come. Some come in the fall, some come in the spring. Um, we've had to reach out a little bit more this year to remind teachers that, you know, we're open and available. Yes. Because they sort of, they get out of the routine. Yes. And this is also a time when a lot of teachers decided to retire. So we have some new teachers. Oh, yes. So we have to reach out to those schools and let the new teachers know. And it's interesting, we had one group that always comes in March, and because it was March, and that's when COVID struck here, yeah. when I looked back and saw they were coming in March of 2023, I saw that they hadn't been here since, of Mar since March of 2019, because they couldn't come in March of 2020, yeah. or March of 2021, or March of 2022. Right. And then four years since that teacher oh my goodness. had been here. Just okay. because of the timing of when they usually come. We miss so much yeah. during that period yes, of time. Do. But yeah. as I said, just by looking at this sheet, you guys are, are trying to make up as much as you, ground as you can this year. Well, part of it is that we were sort of in this mentality of when we couldn't have the school groups come, that we had started to do other things. Yeah. And so sort of what we got in the bind with this year is we had made a lot of commitments to do things apart from the field trips. And then the field trips started coming back. So in some ways, I'd say that I've never been more busy in the 27 years I've been here yeah. than I am this spring. Yeah. Because we're sort of that trying to operate on two tracks, the pre-COVID and the post-COVID yeah. is making us twice as busy. Well, when you, when, well, you sent me a note, that's what precipitated this show, and mm -hmm. you sent it to me, and I said, well, you know, geez, we just did a show last fall. And I said, well, but when I looked at the list of all the new things that you're doing, I mm -hmm. said, yeah, I think we've got something to talk about. Yeah, a lot going on. A lot going on. Yeah. So um, there's some st other things coming up. Explain mm -hmm. to me, this is June 27th, explain to me what the slime program is. Well, apparently mm -hmm. young people love slime. They love <laughs> to make slime. They love to play with slime. We did uh, a slime workshop last year in conjunction with the public library, and it was an overwhelming success. Uh, in fact, there's so many kids showed up that we, we ran out of supplies. Yeah. So that told us that there's a demand out there. We better ha have another slime <laughs> workshop this summer. So yeah, if uh, families are interested in it, they better make sure they sign up early. That's right. Uh, you did it last we did. year. Yes, we did. It obviously was a success. It was a great success, yeah. And now, we're, again, we're doing that in conjunction with the public library. So I think that they are handling the signups for that. But, okay. but it will ha be held here because we have the nice ground. Slime is something you want to make outside. I was going to say, you're not doing it inside Margaret Chase's yeah. place. So we actually have a rain date for that as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's hope, when is it? June 27th? Well, it's Maine. So you never yeah, know. never know. Never know. August 1st, Planetarium. Yes, we don't necessarily do that one every year. That's one we do every other year. And again, because of COVID, it's been a while since we've done it. It's a man named John Meter, yeah. who has a business he calls North Star uh, Planetarium out of Fairfield. And he has two plastic bubbles yeah. that he takes around the state and he sets them up in libraries and gymnasiums or just any place he can find space. I think he can actually do them outdoors as well. And his smaller one fits perfectly within our meeting room where we would we'll be having the main town okay, meeting. Okay, yeah. So we have him come like every other summer and do a program. He usually does one program. Uh, these are planetarium shows. So what he's able is to project the stars up onto the oh. dome. Oh, okay, yeah. And talks the kids through what they're seeing. Oh, nice. Uh, he usually does one program for younger kids and one program for older kids. So he does two programs the day that he comes. Okay, and that's August 1st. Yeah. 
Okay. And again, we'll be do, we do that in conjunction with the public library, Skagen Free Public Library, so people will be able to sign up. Okay. There is a limit because there's only so many people he can fit within the dome. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, Margaret Chase Smith Day, which is in conjunction with her birthday? Uh, it's on August 26th. Um, her birthday is in December, so that's oh. a little problematic for trying to put on events. We used so to try to do something on her birthday on December 14th. And it seemed like we hit a stretch of years where every year it was snowing or ice storming. Yeah. So we decided that December is not a good time to be putting on a public. Probably event. not. Um, so the next obvious date is June 1st, because that's the date when she gave her very famous Declaration of Conscience speech. Okay. The problem with June 1st is that's school field trip season, and you see all we are that we already have going on in the springtime. Yeah, so that was right. a convenient. So we finally settled on August 26th. Um, because it actually turns out to be that that is the date that the 20th Amendment was accepted to, uh, the, the 19th Amendment was accepted to the Constitution in 1920. Yeah. And that gave women the right to vote. Yeah. But then, as we were organizing it last year, we realized August 26th is also the anniversary of the opening of the library. Okay, perfect. It opened on August 26, 1982. So when we did it last year, it was the 40th anniversary of the opening okay, of the library. Okay, that makes sense. So we're sticking to August 26. Last year, well, it would have been on a Friday. This year, it's going to be on a Saturday. And so what we're going to take advantage of is the fact that it's on a Saturday, so that hopefully we can get families here. Yeah. And you have, well, it says food, fun, and games. Yes, we're really going to, again, focus it on families. And we're going to try to have a lot of uh, kid-friendly activities that was, day. Was Kim, your administrative assistant, Kim Nelson, she's involved? In Kim, uh, the whole, whole staff will be involved. But um, Kim Nelson and Nicole Potter are cooking up ideas yeah. of kid-friendly activities that we can it have. It sounds as though Kim is pretty good at that. Yes, she, she, sure um, all this too. her training is as a librarian and what her real interest in is as a youth librarian. Okay. Children's librarian. Okay. Yeah. So that, that sounds like that's going to be an annual event. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think uh, this was a project of the Skowhegan Heritage Committee, in particular Evelyn Bowman. Yes, I remember yeah. You mentioned um, it one. used to be something that was held annually back in the days when SCAG was active. And I'm sure you remember SCAG, Skagigan the Skagigan Community, Community Action, Action Group, Group yeah. Yeah. which I think grew out of the bicentennial in 1976. People like Herb Parody, Herb and, Parody. Yes, and uh, of Shirley Whittemore and uh, Evelyn Bowman. And um, Evelyn was sorry to see it go away, so brought it forward to the Heritage Committee and said, yeah. we need to have a Margaret Chase Smith Day. And they got the Board of Selectmen to declare August 26th as thank Margaret good, Chase Smith thank Day. Thank goodness for Evelyn. She yeah. is definitely a mover and driver. She definitely is. And I yeah. think she is one of the only ones of that yeah. group still with us. Yes. Uh, so we're very fortunate to mm -hmm. have her around. Um, well. You've got, uh, we talked about Earl Shuttleworth, Shuttleworth coming and Dan Saussure. Mm -hmm. And what's coming up in the fall, too, bring that back, too, is the Lee yep. Shaw. And this oh, is yes. in regards to international affairs. Right. Uh, we have money that's been given both to help fund the main town meeting yep. and to fund the Leak Shaw uh, lecture on international affairs yep. um, to friends of... Uh, Margaret Chase Smith, Ada Leake, and Evelyn Shaw gave some money for that. And we do that in conjunction with a group out of Waterville called the Mid-Maine Global Forum. Yep. And they pick a theme every year. By year, I mean an academic year, so September to May. And their theme for the next academic year is going to be climate change. Um, so we'll, we'll be looking for a speaker who can talk about that. Yeah. And I have some ideas of, um, a lot of times what we do is we call upon, since we are affiliated with the University of Maine, we call upon professors in the University of Maine system. And I've got my eyes on some professors there who might be able to give us a perspective oh, so that, on, on climate change and how it is affecting international relations. Certainly a topic right yeah. now, that's for sure. And we certainly, I think, can see evidence of that happening. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know about our five or six inches of rain that we had a month ago, mm -hmm. whether that had anything to do with climate change, but it was pretty severe. Well, on the global scale, the concern is that as climates get affected, what it's going to do is what's called climate migration. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to get areas that are so heavily impacted by drought that people can't live there, so they're, they're going to go somewhere else. That's right. Um, and apparently, a lot of the issues in the Middle East over the past 10, 15, 20 years have very much been driven not so much by the politics. It's been by the effects of the changing climate yeah. and that farmers can't farm. And so they're going to cities or they're trying to get to Europe. And it's going to be that those the movements of people that are really going to disrupt the world order. And we've already seen that. I mean, we remember uh, refugees trying to get into Europe and Absolutely. the problems that that created. Absolutely. And I suspect that in many ways, the reason we see so many people um, from Latin America, from Central and South America, trying to get into the United States, and, and I think some of that is climate driven. Mm. The agriculture down there isn't sustaining people the way that it used to. Certainly government driven do. But well, yeah, there's lots of political issues yeah. in those countries as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, climate you, change is such a topic. And yeah. Enough, we might have enough movement within the United States itself because mm -hmm. of climate change. Yeah, I think even internally, the way that we'll move around, and if you live in a coastal area in a certain part, you might get tired of those sure. hurricanes. Look at, look at like rolling uh, through California all those floods, with all the years forest of forest fires. Yeah. Now, now, maybe they've made up for that for a little while. Apparently, they have, yeah. With 10 feet of snow in the, in the uh, mountains yeah. and so forth, but who knows? That could be short lived. Yeah. We'll see. So the professor I have most in mind, he has, he's looking at this in, he's actually an anthropologist, so he, a lot of what he is learning about sort of the longer effects of climate change by doing archaeology, he's been, in particular been interested in what is the history of climate change in South America. And when I say climate change in South America, I mean like over the past 500 years, not just the past 50 years or 100 okay. years, even, even pre-industrial revolution. Oh, interesting. So um, we're going back because I mean, away. the concern today is the fear that the industrial revolution is, there's always been climate change. The climate just inherently changes. Um, but one of the concerns is the effect that humans have on that climate exactly. change. So he's trying to go back to even before pre-industrial days to see what the impact, because particularly in South America, we hear about um, El Nino, El yes. Nino and El Ni La Nina. Yes. Um, and those cycles, which are driven out of the ocean, have been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. So he's interested in what those effects have been on in on, on the people in South America. Should be fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we haven't officially lined him up yet, but that's that's my hope. Let's hope. Yes. Let's hope that's coming in October. Sometime. Yes. Yeah. October or November. Okay. Is usually when we try to have that. And then the final piece I've got here is, uh, for late this year, is Modern Maine Authors Book Discussion Series. Yeah, we'll do another book discussion series in the fall. And this one we were able to do because we got a grant from the Maine Humanities Council. Um, and they furnished the books for us. And um, one of the issues during COVID was where to get books because it was go wasn't going to be easy to distribute books to people. Yeah. So what we started doing there is looking online. And there's certain websites you can go to, uh, the most famous ones called Project Gutenberg. And they have a lot of the, the classics or the classic writers. Their writings are available freely on Project Gutenberg because they're out of copyright. Copyright only last for a certain amount of time. Okay. So I think you got to get to about, I think it's about 75 years for copyright, and there's actually ways that it can be extended. Um, so you're talking about like things, literature before the 1940s might be freely available. After the 1940s, it's not going to be because it's still under copyright. Okay, gotcha. So we'd gotten to this, you know, several years of reading these old books, old books, old books. And you know, the classics are classics for a reason. People enjoy them. but. You know, people want some more current literature. Yes. Uh, so the Humanities Council came through and gave us this grant so we could get some more current books. And these are all um, either, uh, they, they may be all Maine authors, so it's either Maine author or, or based in Maine, but they have, all have very strong Maine connections. Uh, the first one is called Night of the Living Res by Morgan Talty. 
uh, which is his experiences growing up as a Native American in the Old Town area. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And he is winning a lot of acclaim. He's winning lots of awards for this book. Um, and then uh, we have a book uh, by a woman named Carrie Arsenal, which is about the Androscoggin River. Okay. Uh, and the effects of the mill on the river in the Mexico Rumford area. Um, and the third book is by Meredith Hall and it's called Beneficence. Okay, so those would be three main themed books, much more contemporary, all from the 21st century. Is Carrie Arsenal and her Milltown book, Rumford, uh, the Androscoggin, going to talk about how it's cleaned up over the years? Well, it's more going to talk about the effects of when it wasn't cleaned clean. up and the effects that it had on people's health. Ah, that should be very yeah. interesting. And it's actually an interesting corollary into a book we did several years ago called When We, Are, when we Were the Kennedys by Monica Wood which is her family memoir of growing up in Mexico, Maine, with her father working at the paper mill in Rumford. Okay. Yeah. Well, you hear the stories about a uh, higher rate of cancer yeah. in that area. Because yeah, of that's that. what Kerry Arsenault's writing about. Okay, yeah. that, should, that should be very fascinating, yeah. too. So, yeah. so you've got a ton of stuff coming up. We have a very busy year in 2023. Now, uh, and we've kind of gone through the list, but there's mm -hmm. some other things and ongoing things and mm -hmm. so forth that you have here. But one thing I, I read, I actually read one of your more recent newsletters, mm -hmm. in that you were talking about the need to keep Margaret Chase Smith's name out mm -hmm. in the public and that now you've got uh, a mm -hmm. generation of not only students, but teachers as well who weren't alive uh, when Margaret J. Smith died back in 1995 and, and the efforts to keep her name mm -hmm. alive. And of course, with all the events going on, you're doing your best mm -hmm. in order to do that. But as part of that, uh, of course, with the, the new school coming into Skowhegan, mm -hmm. uh, that school replaced North Elementary and I think Bloomfield, but also it would take the place of the Margaret J. Smith School, which mm -hmm. is there on that site. So the question was, what's going to be the name of the new school? Mm -hmm. And this, I think this article you wrote was back in March. Mm -hmm. So I think some, has some more information come to light since then? Yeah. So um, you mentioned Margaret passing away in 1995. We're actually coming up on the anniversary. It was on May 29th, 1995. Yep. So if you do the math, that's 28 years ago. Yep. Every single student in school is post-Margaret. And it was my realization last year, some of these teachers weren't Even born teachers. when Margaret yeah, Chase Smith passed that's right. away. Um, so that was a very sobering realization. Um, so, you know, we got our work cut out to try to keep her name alive. And one of the ways that it will be kept alive is through the school here in Skowhegan. Um, the school board had solicited people to make suggestions of what the new name should be. And I understand the rationale and that it wasn't going to just be a Skowhegan school. Right, right. There'll be kids from other communities going there, kids from Canaan. I think they're closing the school in Canaan. Yeah. And they'll be going to the Margaret Chief's, well, the new school. Right. Um, so they put it out there and people came up with suggestions and that they were taking a poll. So we just put on our Facebook pages that the school board is interested in knowing what people's opinions are about this. And when we put it up, it is the one single post in probably over, I think we've been doing Facebook for about 15 years, uh, one single post that received the most hits. Over 6,000 people um, mm. linked and, onto it. Yeah. Now, have they made a... It, they have. It they is official. Have. It is official. Yes. And I thought it was. Yeah. So I just wanted it just to came out in the most it. recent SAD 54 newsletter, yeah. which was in the past month that came out. And it's officially going to be... Uh, it's not just... It's the Margaret Chase Smith School now. I think it's going to be something like the Margaret Chase Smith Community School now or something. That, yeah, something that like sounds that. right. So I thought I had read that. Yes. I just wanted to make absolutely yeah. sure. And I remember when I was first thinking about the merger and everything, I mm -hmm. said... 
they should keep the Margaret Chase. Oh, that was the name. overwhelming opinion. Yeah. Do not change the name no. of the Margaret Chase. Festival. And, you know, I know it's beyond just Skowhegan, but she's... She the represented the whole state. Right? Yeah. yeah. You don't just represent your hometown. When you were a senator, you represent the whole state. Yeah. So I think that's perfect, yeah. and, and so that's another thing that keeps. But her name is on. It's kind of fascinating on a number of, in a number of buildings. It is, um, and you gave kind of a chronology of when yep. those yep. names went on. The, and one of the first, the first one, was uh, out at what was Camp Moden mm -hmm. at the time in a, in a is it a residence hall or in a... Uh... Oh, I believe it is the building, and I don't know what they called it, but it's the building that has the stage in it. Yeah. Um, so it's like a community. Community, yes, there. I've been yeah. there. Yeah, I've yeah. been there. So for those of you, and, and you know, I can't just assume that everybody goes back as far as history <laughs> as we do, mm -hmm. but of course that was uh, that is now Lake George mm -hmm. Regional Park mm -hmm. where Camp Moden was. And yeah. Camp Moden was originally uh, for uh, Jewish kids from basically inner city, New York, and mm -hmm. stuff would would come up here and uh, and uh, really had a chance to appreciate outdoor life. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for area people, we never even. Saw saw the place, or hardly saw mm -hmm. the place, but they relocated, I think, down to the Belgrade area? I think so, yes. Down yeah. in that area, and then the Lake George Park took that over. Mm -hmm. uh, towns of Skowhegan and Canaan yeah. collaborated on that, and now we have a chance to see what a beautiful place that is. But anyways, in that... Well, Daryl White was just here last night for the book group, and yeah. he is the director of Lake George, so he was giving us an update on some of the new activities they're um, trying to have over there. They're um, going to have story walks, and this is where you take a book, a children's book, and you chop it up and have kids go around and read it page by page. So it's a way of encouraging them to get more active, to go oh, around and read the story. I see, yeah. I see. And they're going to have like uh, a little uh, playground that they're going to do as a nautical theme. Yeah. Uh, again, the idea to get kids more active. Yeah, absolutely. Not just to be at the beach, playing on the beach, <laughs> actually, eating at the snack shack, to actually, get out on the grounds and learn some be, stuff. Learn yeah. some stuff, read some stuff, yeah. play as well, and use, use their imagination. And actually, going back to, you know, I was talking about keeping Margaret Chase Smith's name mm -hmm. alive. One of, uh, I think, like the last thing uh, in regards to her name was a embassy building in Liberia or uh, it's something? At, it's at the embassy building in yeah. Liberia. Yeah. There's The library there is named after her. After her. Yeah. And that yeah. was as recent, was it 2009 or something? Like yes. That when they did that. Yeah. So, so there's been a lot of efforts to keep her name yeah. alive, and I'm sure you folks will be in the forefront of that. Angie, our past librarian here, uh, used to keep a list of things that had been named after Margaret. And yeah. it's over 20, it's probably close to two dozen yeah. um, rooms, buildings have been named after yeah. Margaret Chase Smith. Well, yeah. I'm sure you guys are gonna do your best. So the other Camp Moden story is, oh, okay. um, is Amy Calder. She, yes. she worked at Camp Moden. Okay. I think she was a cook at Camp Moden. So she'll probably be sharing some Camp Moden stories with oh, us. Well. If she doesn't, I will ask her about There's her time. There's another at, teaser to come. There you go. And of course, so many people in Skowhegan know Amy anyways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And her family. And her family yeah. when she grew up here. And of course, through all her articles in the Morning Sentinel. So mm -hmm. that should be fascinating. Now, we still have a few minutes left. Um, you've got some other ongoing programs that you take part in. And one... One is National History oh, yes. Day. You want to yeah. tell us a little bit about that? So obviously it's a national program. It's existed since 1974. It was started to try to get kids interested in history by doing their own projects. And it's school-based. It's um, for sixth graders through 12th graders. So there's two divisions, a junior division and a senior division, six through eight and then nine through 12. And there's different categories. Um, documentaries, uh, websites, papers, exhibits, performances, and you can do it either as an individual or a group. So between individual, group, category, and junior, senior, there's like a lot of different yeah, divisions, divisions in which people yeah. can win. So each state has their own program, 
And depending on the size of the state, um, there'll be regional competitions. So for the state of Maine, we have two regional competitions, one in the southern part of the state, one in the northern part of the state. And then the winners there can go on to the state competition, which is held at the University of Maine. We run, uh, so one of our staff people, John Taylor, who oversees the program, we do it in conjunction with the history department at the University of Maine. So the, national, uh, the state competition was held at the beginning, uh, at the end of April at the University of Maine. And so the winners have been selected in all those different categories that I spoke about. And it looks like we're gonna have a contingent about 29 students that are gonna go down to the national competition, which is always held at the University of Maryland in, mm -hmm. in mid-June. Okay. Uh, so that's coming up. Any John's from, getting ready for that. Well, that sounds exciting. Any from right around the Skowhegan area? I don't think we have anyone from the local area this year. In the past, we have. There was in the past, back when Amy's sister, Laura <coughs> Richter, oh. was a social studies teacher at Skowhegan Area Middle School. There was many years where she had students who went down to the national competition. Okay. How did they become aware of this? Uh, they become aware of it through the promotional efforts of John Taylor. Okay. Uh, but, uh, but so what he's doing is sending out information to the schools and to the teachers. Yeah. And you know, it, it's very much dependent upon teachers taking these students under their wings. Okay. And another thing is you have the Margaret Chase Smith essay contest. We with do. Being yeah. high school seniors in this, right? right. Yeah. We have been doing that since uh, 1997. Uh, so this is the 27th year that we've done it. And we always pick a theme. The theme this year uh, was climate change. And <laughs> yeah. that was because um, there were some anniversaries. I think this was, or 2022, 2023 were uh, anniversaries of either either one or the other or both uh, the Clean Air and the Clean Water Act. Right, right. And Senator Muskie, Muskie. was the great champion of those, especially the Clean Water Act, yes. having come from Rutherford on the Androscoggin <laughs> yes. River. He, which, he understood the issue. Ha having gone to Bates and uh, yes. was, uh, been near the Androscoggin River during the early 1980s, I can attest that in the morning when you went to get breakfast, you would smell the Androscoggin River and you'd see the chunks of foam floating down the Androscoggin River. Okay. That's been cleaned up. I remember. And yeah. you know, there's still warnings about eating the fish in the rivers because of the mer mercury that's still in the river. Still in the river yeah. after all these years. Oh, yeah. uh, and the other was, um, it was an anniversary of uh, Rachel Carson's very famous book, Silent Spring. Uh, so because of those historical commemorations, we picked that theme. and we got a very good response. We were very impressed with the essays that young people wrote. This is definitely a topic that young people are thinking about. Yeah. No, very good. Yeah. So yes, we have selected the prize winners and we are in the process of notifying them. We have um, three top prizes and then five honorable mentions, and with the top prize being a thousand dollars. thousand dollars, right? Yeah. 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 Oh. And what do you have? You have a, I guess you call it a little awards program for fifth graders at Margaret Chase Smith yeah. School. That is one that's was got very much disrupted by COVID. Yeah. Uh, so it's been a few years since we were involved with that. Um, that is something the school selects, um, and what they do is select the students on the basics of their good citizenship. Okay. Yeah. So and citizens what, award. Yeah. yeah, and what we used to do is we uh, would go over and help with the award ceremony. We would usually give them a rose in honor of yeah. Margaret Chase Smith oh, yeah. and uh, a book about Margaret Chase Smith as well. But like I say, we haven't done that since COVID. Okay. Hopefully we'll, we'll get back to that once life settles itself out a little bit more. Well, it sounds to me as though you've gotten back to a lot of things, mm -hmm. uh, really gotten back to a mm -hmm. lot of things. So I, I'm hoping that this year goes smoothly, hopefully. We made it through four no and a half more, months. <laughs> no more COVID setbacks yeah. and that we can just go on with our life mm -hmm. the way it used to be, yeah. which is, which is kind of nice. Yeah, this is the first year where we've really had that feeling in terms of the school groups that things are 
getting more back to normal. But I mean, there's still the residual effects. We still have the markers on the floor saying keep six feet away. We oh, still yeah. have the plexiglass at the uh, front desk, although we did take down one of them because it's just got to be too obstructive to try to hand things back and forth with the school kids to have those plexiglass uh, barriers up. So slowly but surely, we're getting back to pre-March of 2020. Well, that is certainly good to, to hear. We missed anything. You did an excellent job. You did some things that aren't even on that sheet. Oh. So your memory is much better than you give yourself credit for. Well, good. The only other thing I'll uh, bring <clears throat> up is that we just found out about this yesterday. Um, Hannaford has its programs. Uh, where if you get the reusable bags, yes. they'll give a dollar to a nonprofit or organization. And so we have been selected for the month of June oh, fantastic. for the reusable bags. So if you buy a bag at the Skowhegan Hannaford, a dollar for each one purchased in the month of June will come to the Margaret Chase Smith Library. And every year they pick us, they have two programs. One is bouquets of flowers and the other is the reusable bags. And we were very fortunate last year they picked us for the month of August. And that is the best month in Skowhegan to be picked for the reusable bags. Do you know why? August? Why? The fair. The fair, of the course. The fair. That should, we, have, that should have come we, to mind. We brought in a lot of money last, last August because yeah. of the fair. Oh, yeah. good for you. Yeah. So, so we thank Hannaford for that. Yeah, they're good about community yeah. projects. Yeah, like every that. month, yeah, they're picking out a group both for the bouquets and for the reusable shopping bags. So I want to remind people, and this show should be on the air at least a few days prior to the uh, main town meeting on mm -hmm. May 25th, but, um, but I think we pretty much already got set the number of people who are going to be at that. Yeah, point. we can't at this point. It's not like the you numbers are close, call but you'll be able to watch it on Channel 11. Yes, we are covering that. Yes, we are. Okay. All right. Fantastic. So, uh, David Richards, I'd like to thank you very much for being with us, and I'm sure not too far down the road in the future, you will come up with some new topics. Well, you said that the last time you were here, and I took you up on that offer. You did, and, and we I'll came. Take you up again when we have well, thank some you. new things to talk about. So, thank you very much again, David, and now you know.